I have to remember to turn the recording on. So we're doing these classes because we had several adult students come in the, or adult amateur musicians, I should say, come in the shop and say, you know, I'm not really playing. I'm not really practicing. I don't have any concerts or rehearsals and they just lose their mojo. And I've totally lost my mojo, so I understand it. So we decided we needed to do something fun just for the adults. So that's what this is. So if you've missed the first two classes, they were wonderful. They are alive forever and ever and ever on the Hutzmaker Violins YouTube channel. You can go see them anytime. I highly recommend doing that. And um, a little housekeeping, little thing. I don't know, probably everybody are, are very Zoom proficient these days. So if you're not muted, stay muted while we're doing, while Raymond's doing all of his stuff. Um, you can, if you have questions, when you have questions, throw them in the chat box. If he doesn't see them, I will interrupt him and ask him the questions and all that good stuff. And um, ah, I have a chat box. Yes. I don't know if this is something that when I do it, it does it for all of y'all or whether y'all have to do it, but up on the top right hand corner, at least on a laptop, on a desktop where it says view, if you will hit speaker view, then um, what will happen is that when Raymond is talking or I'm talking, you'll see full screen. So you'll be able to see him much, much better. I'm sure I'm forgetting something else there. Um, so we have, after today, we have, what is today? Today's third one, five more of these classes. The entire schedule is on the Huffmaker and Violin's Facebook page. Please come to all of them. There, um, there's some super neat people lined up. And um, there's, I've had people actually calling me and asking me if they can send in money for this. There is no charge for this. Um, this is just something fun that we want to do to help out. Um, if you need some work done on your instrument or want to buy a $50,000 cello, think of us, come see us. Otherwise, just know that we love y'all and want to support you. So if you've been to the first two, you have noticed that I, since I got to schedule these, I got to pick all my favorite people to be the clinicians. Well, tonight, <laughs> Let me tell you about my friend Raymond. Yes, he's in the Atlanta Symphony. Yes, he's a crazy, amazing violinist. But that's not what I love the most about him. Well, the first thing I love the most about him is he has a wicked sense of humor. I cannot be held responsible for anything that comes out of this man's mouth. I'm just saying. I'll but, try. Yeah. But he has a passion for bows that is unequaled and that you normally don't find in players. You usually find them in collectors, restorers, makers, but he has a passion for bows and he has a knowledge about bows that just is amazing. So tonight he's going to talk to us all about bows. Like I said, throw your questions in the chat box and Raymond, you can take it away, sweetie. So yes, for me, bows are very special. They're much more special than I, I lean towards that. And when I was 15 years old, this is how it all started. When I was 15 years old, I won a prize. I grew up in Hong Kong. So the Hong Kong Music Festival, there is the traditional Chinese instruments and there's also um, the, the Western instrument, two different categories. Can you hear me? Yeah. So what happened was that I was, uh, the winner of the Western music. Uh, and then there's a traditional Chinese music musician who wanted to. So both of us were underage. So the prize for winning that was to attend the Edinburgh Festival in Scotland for a week. So here we go. We flew there and all of that. And then since we were underage, <laughs> Mahala, can you mute yourself, sweetie? I thought I... I, thought I, I, thought I, I, I think... Yes, 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 yes. All right. I think we lost her. She'll be back. Sorry, okay. Ray. Go ahead. So, oh, fine. It's fine. So we flew there. And then since we were underage, they provided a tour guide for us because we have to be monitored 24-7. So... Her father happens to be a violinist 
in London. And she said, do you want me to call my father and see if, if you want to go into a violin shop to just look around? I said, hey, this is great, you know? So we went into this violin shop uh, and they started showing us things, left and right, bows, tours, picots, you name it. Everything, just strats, Dao Jesus. So got to be very close to them. And my friend, Malcolm, who, who owned the shop, happened to love bows as well. So he started showing me bows and gradually I got addicted to it. I was just really addicted to bows. And my first lesson from Malcolm, he shoved the bow in front of me and said, look at it. I said, yeah. He said, what do you think it is? I said, I have no idea. Where is the stamp? And he looks at me and he says, Tour never stamped his bows. That was my first lesson. So for whatever it's worth. So you start learning the styles of bows, how they feel. But for me, yes, the, the, the making side is very important. But for, for me personally, if the bow doesn't play, it's not good. I need it to play, so I need both. So every time I go to the shop, um, they will say, you know, this this bow is it's good for Raymond, and then Malcolm will always say, uh, I don't think so because it it it's not it's not clean enough and it doesn't play. So all those things were, you know, trying to get together. So over the years, I have they have helped me a lot. And they would, you know, one time I, I remember I walked into the shop, I would have a, a Christmas vacation from school. I was in university already. So I would arrive there and, and spend a week, week and a half just sitting on the bench, looking at them doing all of this stuff and basically learn more about bows and fiddles. So one time he looked at me and he says, there's a bow hanging up there on the peg. We haven't done any work on it yet. Look at the bow, see if you like it. I said, look at the bow. I mean, the bow looks good. I mean, go and play on it. So I said, well, let me try and see what happens. So I play on it, loved it. What is it? I'm not gonna tell you. You should never know what it is. And you should not let the price affect your decision. So that went on for three days. I just played on the thing and play on the thing. And finally I said, you know, this is a really good bow. He says, is this something that you would like to have? If it is, we have to clean it up and put, it, put this on and that on and change. I said, yeah, I think so, but I, I, I don't have money. It's a picot. So they said to me, uh, he said to me, you know, why don't you put it in your case? And I said, what do you mean? And put it in your case. And he immediately he issued a certificate in the like two hours, but put it in the in the in the in my violin case and said to me, pay us whenever. If you don't like it, take it back. So that's how I get to see all these things and with friends that help me out. So I still like to help people out because I was helped. So that's how all those came along from for me. I was about 16 when it started. So it's a long time. And I didn't know about the Picard and uh, flew back to the States and he called me up and he said, oh, by the way, that bow was um, led by the concertmaster of the London Symphony for 30 years. And I said, why am I having the bow? He said, because you liked it. So that's how they were and that's how I get to see all these things and, and all these accessible for me. So I have learned a lot from my uh, friendship with them. And that's how all these things came along. So it's interesting, but uh, so one thing after another, that's just one bow. Then, then another bow comes another story and uh, please,
Natalie wants to know if you still have that bow. Yes. I, I, I'm like a pack, pack rat with bows. I rarely get rid of them. And there are bows here that I have, there's one bow that I think somebody that is here right now that loves it, loves the bow. That's another story. But the thing is, I have that bow for close to 40 years. And I, I yes, I still have those bows. Oh, oh, he also says, can you leave it to her in your will? <laughs> Absolutely. As long as you don't want the one I want, then we're going to have yes, That's another one. But, but that's how it all came along. Each one has its story. Each one has its, its attachment to, for me. And, and um, not to mention that they are, you know, so I, I graduated. After about five, six years of knowing them, I graduated. Every time I walk into the shop, he would just, Give me a bunch of keys and held up this one big thick key. That's the key to the safe downstairs. So I get to go to that safe and go through all of their incredible bows, boxes of tours, boxes of picots, boxes of early French bows and cellos, violins, you know, whatever I want to see. So I, I, I think I was lucky. So that's how I came along. So how often do you buy new bows today and add to your collection, just out of curiosity? Rarely, very rarely. Well, it's, it's, it's that time. You know, when you get to a certain age, you, you got to be responsible. <laughs> you know, it's like, a, it's like gambling, you know, you, you can't stop. You know? <laughs> so no, I, I, it's much slower now. I haven't purchased a bow for, I think at least, well, a couple of years, that's pretty good. <laughs> so a lot of the people here tonight um, did start and play, they either played when they were kids and quit for 30 years yeah. and picked it back, yeah. or they started, re, you know, in the last 10 years or whatever. So they have, may not have had the opportunity to try lots of bows and yeah. kind of bow education. So if they decided they wanted to go buy a bow, what's the first advice you would give them? Well, bows are personal. Bows are extremely personal. But there are some parameters that I think it's good to talk about. For example, how often do you hear players say, I want a heavy bow because it pulls a better sound? Well, I, from my experience, the heavy bow will pull a darker sound but it also cuts out all the overtones because it's so heavy. So you have this bow that will sit on the string and it wouldn't budge. And you sometimes will have difficulty moving the bow or playing it off the string. So um, it depends on what you need the bow for. The bow usually, well, in this case, I think you would need to find a bow that plays well with everything. So um, something like mid-range, like violin bows, I would say 59, 60 grams would be, would be a good bow, you know, some, somewhere around there because I, I have a 64 gram bow. I, I cannot move that thing. I took it in orchestra once I thought my arm was gonna drop because it, was, there, it took so much effort to play it. So you, you have that to think about a lot of it. Um, it depends on the sound you want. Do you want a sound that is on the harsh side or do you want the sound that is on the breathier side? So there are all these concerns that you need to, you need to know the bow. You need to understand what you're looking for in a bow. And we always, well, I always hear this as well. When you want to, when you pick a bow up, you want to see if it is just like the bow you had. How often have we heard that too? You know, you go to a violin show, you say, yeah, but this doesn't play like my bow. So my friend Malcolm always said that, well, if you like your bow, why are you looking for another bow, right? 
So that's another thing. So it, you get to understand that a bow is like a person. No two bows will play ever the same. So when you're looking for a bow, you have to look for the personality, what the bow would do for you. Uh, most of the time with good bows, with, they're sensitive. So if you try and say, I'm going to play this thing, usually it will squawk on you. And it usually will have a, a bad result in doing that. You let the bow play with you. You let the bow do what you want the bow is capable of doing. So all of that comes into play. So where do you draw the line? That again is personal. It's extremely personal. So I think that the more bows you try, the more you realize that you will never hit two bows the same ever. Similar, yes, but even that, if you get to know the two bows, they are not the same. So with that, I think you could keep on exploring. But you know, a bow is a funny thing too, I think. If you hit on the one that you love, you know right away. You will know right away. And there are certain times that when you, when you have experienced that with a bow, you, you realize that you should listen to your instincts and not have somebody that tells you, well, maybe he's not good at it. No, 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 not that. Because he's not the one playing it, you are. So it's, it's a good idea that you follow your instincts because you're feeling the bow, he's not. So that instinctual thing for me is important. So what do you tell them though? I hear a lot of adults that say um, they don't feel like they have enough experience to be able to do that, to trust their instinct, to tell the difference, that kind of thing. Um, is that something you have to be a pro to really know? Or is it something you feel like you can tell after playing three years? I think you can tell after playing for three years. My first bow, student bow, there were mm -hmm. six German bows that came to the violin shop. And um, these three are a little bit more expensive to, than the other three. So my teacher was there. He said, play on this, this is a good bow. Play on this, this is a good bow. Play on that. I played on it and it was okay. And I picked up one that he said, no. I picked it up, I said, this is the bow. This is the one that I like. He said, no, this is not a good bow. I went against it and I got yelled at afterwards. But I was a kid, you know, but the thing is that I went with it because for me, when it fits, you can do so much more with, with it's a tool. It has to agree with you. And um, I think that uh, it's important to pay attention to that too. You should always have somebody there to listen for you. Because sometimes with a bow, when you play it, it makes certain noises that doesn't go out there or it does the opposite. So it's a good idea that you have somebody there that you trust, listen to the sound that you're creating and uh, have the other person play on it for you maybe uh, to evaluate what is the, the result that you really want. Is this kind of um, sound pleasing to your ear? And again, it's so personal that you cannot possibly say, you know, my favorite thing with, with, with a lot of the violin stuff you watch is, I have a bow perfect for you. That's my favorite line. I look at them like, okay, <laughs> right? Because there's no such thing. I think what they really mean is that it's perfect in its sense that it's clean, it's well made, it's in good preservation. That's what they really mean. But for the player, you inter in interpret it some with something else. Perfect for you is like, there's no such thing as a perfect bow, I think. Oh, I think there is. I'm just saying. So, all right, Christina wants to know, what yes. is your opinion on carbon fiber bows? And do you own one? I do not own a carbon fiber bow. I have played on many of them. I think that there are some that pose a very nice sound. They feel great. The balance is good. The balance is always good, most of them. 
that I have played. But the sound in general, now I'm, uh, I'm not saying that they all are. The ones that I have tried usually, usually pose a, uh, a sound that is a little bit on the edgy side, a little bit. And I don't think that they feel the same under the hand. When you hold the bow up, when they, they, they somehow don't feel the same here. I think it's because the vibrations on the wood is different than carbon fiber. There are some differences there. But the thing is, yes, as a tool, some of them are really wonderful, no question. All right, Karen Peters says she's gone to shops for bows and she's always asked for her price range. Yes. And so she says she's using a guesstimate, but she hasn't found the right bow. How do you get around that? And I actually like, I wanna actually talk about price ranges too, because that's the first place often a shop will start and a musician will yes. start. So. Well, that's a good ballpark, I think, most of the time when you say, well, the range. So when, instead of, well, for me, I suggest people instead of saying that, well, 15,000, let's say, I would say something like, how about between 12 and 18? So you have something to work with. So what if this particular bow that you really love is 18 and a half? So there are ways that you could justify that. Spending that much, that $500 more, you probably will have a bow that will last you much longer and that you will enjoy playing. But it's hard to say, it depends. Sometimes you don't find anything, even with a price range like that. So that's my experience. So if you've had a student that's been playing, you know, three or four years, yeah, they're capable, they're playing well, but they're not, you know, um, what price range do you usually suggest they start at? So, uh, students, do you mean? Yeah, yeah. So somebody that's only been playing a few years, what would you suggest they start at? Because they're not going to start at 15000 No, 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 no. Students, uh, anywhere from twelve fifty that to about 2500 3000 that would be really a very good student bow mm -hmm. of that end. It depends on how committed they are. If a, a student says, I come in, a, a, I, I practice four hours a day, sure. I think it's a good idea. If you buy a $3,000 bow and let it sit, uh, or they're not sure if they want to play the violin, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel that it's justified. It really depends on the parents. It depends on the kid, so. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, we had a question that they wanted to know, are, do you use different bows for different composers? Actually, it, yes, I do. Uh, in orchestra, most of the time, I, I don't do that because you don't get to hear your sound in orchestra most of the time. So I, I pick a bow up that is reliable, that would do good spaccato, that would good, do long, good playing, middle of the road for everything. Because the sound, if, if the sound is that much better, you don't get to enjoy it. It just blends right in with, it, with everything else. But for solo playing, yes, I do. Uh, and it depends on the composer. It depends on the piece sometimes. The bow that you like, I always reserve it for classical music. So that is something that it's really good at because it's very bouncy. The sound is very bouncy and it's not a heavy bow, it's 56 grams. So it's light and it's, it can do everything. A Mozart concerto, perfect. If you play a little bit later, like a Mendelssohn concerto, it's a little bit too, too light for that kind of playing. So it depends on what I feel comfortable. Yes, I do choose different bows. Um, so, I love this question. This is awesome. Which bow would you bring to work when there's Colenio involved? And will you explain? Because maybe not everybody knows what Colenio is. But Colenio is playing the playing on the string with the wood. So it depends on the piece. 
uh, sometimes in orchestra, I, I flip the bow. It looks like I'm flipping it, but I, I don't actually use really that much wood. I use most of the hair. So I let my colleagues work. So it's uh, so this preserve my bows, you know. But Colenio, yeah, it it's hard because when you hit on the string like that, you're going to get some nicks and dents there. But I haven't encountered a solo piece that uses Colenio yet. If it is, it's for for a brief time, if I remember. But you're not taking one of your great bows and beating it against the string. I try not to. Okay. So, no. so going back to an intermediate bow question, Aaron, yes, was asking, Aaron was asking, are there specific things that an intermediate player should look for in a bow? So um, bounce, strength. Aaron can tell you actually, Aaron, if you want to unmute, you can say, um, I'm not asking it. Um, well, so I mean, I guess I'm asking, is there like a specific material that you're looking for or a specific way, or is it just all dependent on the player and what they can pull out of a bow? Yes, depends on the violin uh, or what an instrument, uh, the bow and the person. I think they all work together. And I think that um, it's important that you've, well, with a bow, you have to find a bow that you can draw a straight bow without having it go like this, jitters from beginning to end. That probably is a bow that is a little bit on the weak side, probably. But there are many factors that affect it because sometimes the bow can be out of camber, could be, could be the, the, one of the curves is not quite right. Uh, that you will have to rely on the, the person, the bow maker to determine what, what is going on with it. But this, the, most of the time, if the bow is a little bit on the weak side, I think it will do that. And when you start pressing on it, and that's when it starts jittering. And that's something that is really difficult to pull a even sound from beginning to end for me. And of course you do have to play off the string so the bow has to have a good bouncing point and the bouncing point is a place that you need to find because every bow again is different. And to make sure you have a good combination of both. Sometimes there are bows that would just bounce. Sometimes there are bows that would just sit on the string and it's not an even thing. You know, Raymond, I have to say that long bow, I think is so important when you're trying out bows and it, you can be, an abject beginner, but if you can do a long bow across the string, you can tell a lot about a bow. You know, the funny thing that, that I, I always tell people, you know, the, the violin bow was originally arched this way, the Baroque bows, right? About 1810, then everything started switching. And then you have this curve going on, you know, even a little bit before that, but it's not standardized. When the bow started curving this way, the bow was basically designed to bounce, right? Not like the other bows. So I always say that if you take somebody into a room and give them the bow that have never played the violin before and put the bow on the string, chances are the bow will go like this because it, it naturally bounces. For a player to sustain a good sound on the on on the violin takes work. It's the opposite of what you're thinking. So, yes, it's important for that. Well, the sound has to be there because if the sound sound is like a, a personality, you must have your sound. So, have to be able to draw the bow and make a good sound. You know, that's how I feel. Natalie wants to know if you are switching up bows when you play chamber music. Yes, I'm one of those crazy ones. One quartet, I would, I would use it. And then the other quartet, I would change another bow. Now, do you mean quartet as in Haydn versus Beethoven? Or do you mean quartet as in these four people, these four people? The quartet as in 
Haydn quartets versus uh, later like Janáček quartets, for example. For Janáček quartet, you need something that is strong and be able to do anything possible with the with the Beethoven and all that. Sometimes I get to you know use the bow you like. So it it depends on the piece. It depends on what it will do for you to get the character that you want. So that's how I determine which bows to use. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, so um, Buddy Hethmaker would like to know. <laughs> yes. He wants to talk about balance. So can you yes. talk about what the balance means to people? And he also says, show us some bows. <laughs> okay, yeah, sure. You see, I was always told to do this. You put the bow up here, you hold the bow and weigh it and, 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 and mentally take a, take a note of how it feels like. And then you put the bow down this way. You will feel that there is a slight difference. If you don't feel any difference, the better the bow. Sometimes you, if you have a, a, a bow that has a big head, right? And you feel this and you go, wow, this is really good. And then you put it down and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. This is like way too much. I don't think it's balanced well. So it's deceptive as well, because when you hold the bow like that, you don't really feel the weight of the bow. The only way to feel the bow correctly is this. This you will feel the bow. But the balance, I, I think, is the most important thing in choosing a bow. The balance always comes first. And if you, if you have a bow that you can do this comfortably, without having too much weight differences when you do it, I think that's the bow. Does that answer the question? Which bow are you holding right now? It's a modern bow. We like modern bows. Me too. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's just that it's right there. And, and uh, I pulled it out. <laughs> just to demonstrate that, you know, you can try it and see it. You, you have a bow there, you know, you, you can feel it. And you can usually tell a lot, I think. So um, Betsy, I guess, she was asking actually also, do you ever use specific different bows for different violins? Oh, yes. Because the match has to be there. When you, when you have a bow that doesn't match the violin, then it becomes a problem. Yes. Well. Only if you have them to switch out. Some, some people would have two, three bows. Even that, it's good to, to switch it out to have a difference in sound. Well, it's not just the difference in sound, it's the way you feel. And when you feel differently, you play differently with, with the bow. So yes, to me it's important. All right, anyone else have any questions before I ask them to pull out a bow? Show us something pretty. Okay. Um, you see, for, for me, I, I don't use them often enough to put the bow in the case and you know just leave it there. I put it in plastic bags. After that, I put mothballs in there, just in case there are um, bow bucks, which happens quite a lot with the weather, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I don't know why I decided to pull this one, but it's, um, can you? Chris, what is it? That's a tort. Nope. The cot. No. I'm striking out. It's a dog. Ah. I'm sorry. I can see your face better than I can see the bow, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, look at that head. That's a dog. Yes. John Dodd. Uh, this bow used to belong to Willitzers. It's one of their um, one of their collection as example bows that they have, and to me, it's 
extremely interesting. They, they dated 1820, 1820 period. So when you think about it, uh, Tourt was making this style in France across the channel about 18, uh, 1790. It took about 20, 30 years for the boat to get over to England. And this guy started copying tours. So yes, it looks like a, a early tour. I mean, the, the, the bow itself, the head itself looks very much like it. And to me, it plays like a two, but it's not a tour. But it's an interesting bow to show because it's now everybody is saying, well, ivory frog, oh my God, it's, it's such a bad thing. Well, he didn't know that at that time. I think it's, it's a good, good example of it. That's why I decided to pick it out. Can you see it? Such a tiny feral. Yes, very tiny feral. And I don't know how clearly you can see it. On this side is stamp dot on the bottom. Um, so it's, it's an interesting, interesting bow. So at about the same period. Hey, Raymond, before you put that down, does that have whalebone on it? Yes, it does. By the whalebone, because a lot of people don't get a chance to see what it really looks like. I know. Yeah. That's a whalebone that they put probably put down there way before. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it was left there. So this is interesting to see. We, you see how big the sea is? So I think it's interesting. So on the other side, um, to contrast it across the channel. Look at that button. I don't know how well you can see it. See it okay? Mm -hmm. Well, 790 period toured. So that's the time when he started, you know how the Baroque bows are, the buttons are all ivory. So I don't know if you could see it on the camera. I wish I could show it to you in person, but the core of this inside is ivory. It's not an ebony core inside the, the, the button. So it's a development I think from the earlier period of the Baroque bows coming uh, into this um, modern bow type. And after a while, people thought, well, why are we putting ivory with the metal outside? Let's just put ebony, it's cheaper. You know? So that's why I think it what happened. Aaron, so Aaron asked if you would hold that back up again and yeah. hand behind it so you can really see. Is that odd? Does that help, Aaron? It's really hard to see on the computer, but. But the throat is beautiful and it's really quite long. Yeah, it's very long. Uh, but the thing is that, you know, when you, when you think about it, back then they hold the bow back up here. So it wouldn't matter, you, you wouldn't put the thumb in there. So, you know, interesting. So. Um, that's gorgeous. That's, that's pretty, that's a very pretty bow. So this is Anna's bow. Also known as the most beautiful bow in the entire world. Well, this was made by a maker by the name of Perchois. And he was really the missing link of, uh, between Tort and, and Picot. Uh, he started the Viom shop and Picot studied with him. So he was supposed to have uh, study with Tort. We don't really have the documentation of it, but the thing is that he was really making bows just like Tort. A lot of his bows were actually um, mislabeled as a Tort. Well, this one you can't because it's stamped inside. So you can't fake it as a Tort. But the thing is that he, this is a very, very, very rare maker to find. 
And I don't know if you guys can tell on your computer screen, but that head is the most beautiful head. The wood is stunning. And if you look at that curve down of the nose, it's just breathtaking in person. I hope you can tell. So how did the bow, this bow came to me? It's interesting because my violin teacher said, well, when you go over there, see if you can find a bow for me. I said, okay. So these guys were pulling bows out one after another. And they said, well, we have a special bow here, you know? And uh, I said, let me play on it. It was incredible. So at that time, there's no cell phones. There's no nothing. You have to call long distance call and oh, back to the States. And I told my teacher, there's a great bow here. I think you should buy it. And he says, I, I need to see the bow. And I said, oh, go to the library. It's pictured in the Strat magazine. So it's, it's one of those, I, I took it out just in case. That's the bow. So I said, go to the library and look at it. Just look at, look at the bow and see, she said, well, I can't just buy a bow looking at it. I said, well, yeah, so the bow never came back. So a couple of years later, I was given an opportunity to look at a tour. And I've never played on the tour before. That was my first bow. And I played on it. It was like a boat. It was so flexible. It was like all over the place. I was young, you know, I, I, I couldn't play on that thing. And I said, well, where's the other one that you showed me a year ago? He said, well, yeah, we have it downstairs, but we're not selling it. I picked up this bow and I said, you know, I, this, this plays much better for me. So uh, that's how it ended up. Uh, I ended up having it. So Chris, you might find this interesting because I don't know if you know the story because apparently the bow maker, Michael Taylor, walks into the shop every day, goes downstairs, pull this bow out, look at the bow before he starts working. So he was on vacation when all of this happened. He came back, he couldn't find the bow. And he came upstairs and he looked at Malcolm and he says, where's the bow? It's oh, it's gone to a very good home. Don't worry about it. And he said, I'm quitting. That was, that was his inspiration on, on that bow. So I find it very interesting. So every time I see Michael, first thing, I give him the bow because it meant so much to him. And um, it's always here. I said, I'm not going to get rid of it. You know, <laughs> and I, I love this thing, you know, and it plays and it, it's just a wonderful thing. So, you know. So how much do you want for it? Yeah. Uh, uh, get in line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, actually, you know, the funny thing is that somebody asked me, they, they play two notes on it and he said, how much do you want? I said, uh, uh, uh. I, I can't. I, I have too much attachment to it. There's no way. There's there's no way I could let go of it. Maybe maybe later, but right now I just I'm too attached to it. No, I get it. And quite honestly, I have lesser bows that I would sooner sell my instrument than the bow. Say that again. I said I get it totally. I have lesser bows that I would sooner sell my violin than yes. the bow. Yes. Because, you know, it's a funny thing for me, when you're playing on both sides, all the expression comes from the bow. Uh, it, it's, maybe it's not for everybody. Maybe everybody feels differently. But for me, you feel when you, you feel a lot more with the right hand than the, the left hand. So, you know, I'm in a family with um, two professional violinists. Yeah. You know, my wife is a professional violinist and we like, totally different bows. My wife prefers a heavier bow that's more head heavy. Yep. I prefer all my bows are below 60 grams and yes. have, a, have a, a balance point more toward the hand. Whereas right. her bows all have a head heavy and, and they're stiffer. Yes. Um, but you know what? I finally sold her. I finally got her a Franz Albert Nuremberger the second that's actually like 58 grams and she loves it to death. So I, I got her on the, I got her on the, on the good side. That's good. I mean, sometimes it, the 58 gram it, it, the bow can be 
you know, it's the balance that you're talking about as well. Because if the balance is good, it doesn't really matter what the, what how many grams they are. That's how I feel. Because when you play on this thing, you know, it's 56, 57, about around there. And you play on it and you never feel the lightness of the bow. So it, it's that important, the balance. So for whatever is worth. Natalie wants to know if you can talk about the difference between tort and pacat. Yes. Well, the, the tort usually is not lying in the frog. And the pacat usually is. That's one giveaway. And of course, the, the later torts is easier because it's so hatchet, you can see it. But one thing about those two makers is that it doesn't, it's not like looking at a Voran. It's not like looking at a Satori because they, the template that they use, usually they stick to it very closely. But when you see a Tour and the Picard, they're never the same. And yet they, you can spot the maker's hand. That's how I, I, I would put it. Yes. So um, David wants to know, do you have a preference between an octagonal stick or a round stick? Uh, personally, somebody just asked me that question. Some, some, yes, I personally like a round stick. I like playing on a round stick because it feels like it's more stable to me, but there are exceptions. I, the persuade that you like is octagonal. So, that bow doesn't play like a lot of Kaganobo. There, uh, uh, there are exceptions and each, each one is different. So. Luke, May I submit some information on that? What? May I uh, contribute to that? Please, please. Whether a bow is octagonal or round is a kind of a game day decision a bow maker makes while they're feeling the stick and deciding whether the weight and the stiffness is appropriate. Um, it is true that if you were to have the exact same piece of wood and make it octagonal, it would be stiffer. But since you can't take two bows and compare two totally different bows, whether they're round or octagonal or not, the point is that that's just a decision the bow maker makes along the process to decide if he wants to soften the bow or keep it rigid. So in my my personal example is the most flexible bow I own is a Franz Albert Nurmberger the first that is octagonal, and the stiffest bow I own is an August Barbet August Barbet bow that is round. So you can't label everything by round or octagonal. It's just something the maker decides when they're doing it. An unusual one, golden tortoise. Boron, octagonal. You. So it, it this one plays like a, a round stick. It, it doesn't it doesn't uh, feel like it's very high strung. So there are exceptions. And sometimes people say, well, it, I like the look of it, but I think more important is like, what does it really feel like in your hand? Uh, because some octagonal bows can be very hefty. Yes, there are a lot of some English bows, some um, English octagonal bows can be extremely hefty. But the thing is that you, you, you got to try with the violin and it depends on what you use the bow for. And I'll agree with you, most of my bows are round and I prefer round simply because you can see the wood better on a round bow than on an octagonal. You can look into the wood, you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so, no but but I, I would not, look at a bunch of bows and rule out bows simply because they're round or octagonal. That's unreasonable. Well, I agree, but there are people that will choose a bow like that. That I, I have met people that say, well, it's a round bow, I can't have it. Well, it really depends on what it does on your hand, I think. So I, the balance thing is important, it's personal. And again, it, it, what it feels under the hand sometimes an octagonal bow may feel like a round stick. A round stick might feel like an octagonal bow. So well, each person has to pick what they want and they need to get what they want. So when I say it's unreasonable, that's probably far 
maybe too far stated. I'm just saying they're limiting their pool of, of bows that, that may do well for them if they limit it to those kind of- Correct, uh, correct. So let me jump in and let's move on because Lucas wants to know if there are any basic rules on how to match a violin and a bow together. Uh, that's, that's a good one. Um, I have always been told that you should try this. If you have a Strat, which pulls a really high strung sound and very, very uh, treble sound, you should use a Tort, which gives a breathier sound to balance it out. So if you have a Dao Jesu, you want a Picat. That's what I've been told. This is for my friends, right? But I'm one of those. If I have a very high strung violin, I like to use a Picat. I like a fight uh, because I think the sound is, it's, it's a very uh, lively sound when you have overtones that it's all up there. But again, it's a personal thing. Some people like it with too uh, dark sounding, uh, a dark sounding violin, uh, a higher model with, a, with excuse me, sorry. Uh, with with a tour, for example, that pulls a very breathy sound. So it again, it's a personal thing. So if you're talking about great players, uh, I think Gumio, Gumio, I believe he he played on a Daojesu with a Picat. Uh, Sharing played on the Daojesu with a Picat. Test. Um, that I know. Gil Shahan plays on the Strat with the Tourt. So there are so many different people doing different combinations of what is, um, what, what makes them happy. What their concept of sound is, I think is more important. But that's the general rule that I have been told but I don't go by it. <laughs> All right, so Karen is asking my favorite question so far of the evening, I have to say. This one even beats the Colenio question. And I wanna remind you that recording this and this will live on in infamy, so be careful when you answer it. But she wants to know, are there any bow makers that we should stay away from? <laughs> well, it depends on, it depends on what you, um, well, for me, a clunky bow is the worst. Some people like them. So again, it's a personal thing. Um, there are bows that a lot of teachers that knows the maker and they're pushing these bows and they're actually not very good bows. Yes, there are some of them. Uh, that I think the best thing to do is to ask for professional help, like go to the violin shop and ask for an opinion. Try different types of bows. And sometimes you don't even have to have somebody tell you that you should stay away from these. There was one maker, I think it was Clutterbuck. Yes. And I, I looked at that bow one time, I saw a Clutterbuck, well, it was Stan Remo. Because apparently Clutterbuck was one of those makers that really rarely make a bow himself. He has students make it. And then he stamps his, uh, 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 that's according to my, my friends. Um, so I said, what's this? It feels so heavy. He said, oh yes, if you put it on the planner, it will, it will start growing again. That's how he kid, kid around with, with bows like that. So I have instinctually, just say no to that kind of bow because it's just too heavy, way too heavy. So um, I would say that the more you try out on bows, the more you realize that there are certain things that you will stay away from. Let's put it that way. And everybody will have a different list of what to stay away from. Don't you think? Absolutely, absolutely. So. Buddy wants to know what yeah. bows do you have anything that's on your wish list? Me? Yeah. 
I, I wish I have an Henri. Uh, I don't have one. Everybody says Picard, 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 but Pe Henri and Picard work together. But according to uh, Redford, a good Henri is better than a Picard. So I haven't come across a great one yet. Yes, that's on my wish list. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I'm, we're getting a thumbs up from mom and dad. So. Ah. <laughs> yeah, but that's a that's a beautiful maker. It's one of one of the most refined makers out there. I think I have seen I have seen a couple of them golden tortoise ones. They are really really beautiful. But uh, haven't had the opportunity to to come across one for sale. Let's put it that way. So I'll be yeah. keeping our eye out for you. So <laughs> you know. That? We'll all keep an eye out for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> when I was studying in undergrad, my my violin teacher, Oliver Steiner, had an Henri. Yes. And, Simone. and the Simone is still the benchmark for which I choose almost every bow I look at uh, because that bow is so wonderful. But he had an Henri as well. That was a magnificent bow. So they're, they're uh, I, feel, I feel your pain. <laughs> yeah. But it, it's hard to come by one that's clean and one that that just beautiful. I haven't seen many of them. It's just my my luck. I I don't think that it's I I have encountered many of them. Well, sadly, <laughs> shortly after graduating, Mr. Steiner offered me that Simone bow for five thousand dollars, and I was broke. I couldn't buy it. It was a repaired bow, but uh, I've kicked myself for the past 20 years ever since. Which bow was that again? The Pierre Simon. Yes. Those are incredible. Those are beautiful bows. So you mentioned a second ago that you had a clutterbuck that was stamped Rameau. So yeah. let's talk for a second about stamps. Um, yeah. I think that a lot of people think that whatever they see stamped is what it is. No. No, it's this on the same line as looking at the violin, you don't look at the label because most of them are just put in. It could be taken out, put, put, put in, whatever. Um, that's the last thing you should look at, uh, in my opinion. But um, after saying that, I think if you are in the trade, you would know that. So certain makers will stamp differently or what to trust and what not to trust. So, no, you don't look at the stamp or the labels. Kimberly Collar asks, um, do you have any fine modern bows or any other living makers that you really like to champion? There are so many incredible American makers out there right now. All of them are at the highest standard possible. All of them. I mean, the, out in Washington uh, state, there are many, many of them and they are incredible. Uh, I think that there are, well, Chris would know a little bit more about the, the, the American makers, much more than me. Um, but yes, I think the standard of bow making has gone up tremendously in the last 25, 30 years and they are good they're very good there are many people that have said that that actually that we are in a golden age of american bow making yes and, and um i want to just could do a quick commercial and say for any of you guys on this call that are find bows fascinating and beautiful the violin society of america is having a conference in november and it's a virtual conference and there will be a lot of bow makers taking part. There'll be sessions being held by bow makers and you'll get to see some bows. It's all on your computer. So it's completely safe from COVID, but, um, but you can holler at me after the class and I can give you information on that. But um, if you like, if you love the topic of bows or violins, but I'm a bow person, then think about that. So, sorry, that was my commercial ring. So. No, no, but I, I think it's worth looking into because every time you see a new bow maker sometimes it's just so exciting 
mm -hmm. to see that kind of standards out there. Uh, the wood they use, the, the, the cleanliness of how they finish a bow, it's so different than, let's say, even 50 years ago. You know, the interesting thing about all of this is that bows were sold as an accessory, even a hill. They never really issue a certificate unless it's like a tour. This is, you're talking about the 40s, 1940s. They don't really have something that, that, that it's, it's an accessory. It's like the same thing as buying rosin. And they would put it down on the receipt, you know, one violin bow by Picard and the cake of rosin. I mean, I've, I've seen those too. So I think the seriousness of the art itself is getting more and more um, important. It's not just an accessory anymore. People would just buy bows without a fiddle. Uh, that kind of thing is happening. So um, yes, I would recommend that if you have uh, an opportunity to meet a lot of bow makers and see their bows, yes. Because again, it's the same thing. Some will work for you, some will not. It's a personal thing. And um, yes, definitely important. Um, Donna wants to know, what's your favorite rosin? And do you use the same rosin on all your bows? No. <laughs> well, you see, the, the funny thing is that I, I use the Andrea rosin most of the time. The, 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 the rosin that leaves a pinkish tint to your bow hair. I use that and then after you put it on for a while, it starts gumming up. The sound starts muffling. So I use another rosin to alternate, a light rosin to alternate so that it wouldn't gum up. And I do alternate a couple of them. And it seems like it's working. So yeah, a lot of people say don't mix rosin, but I, for some reason that particular uh, type of rosin, which is Andrea, uh, they, they stick too well, let's put it that way. And when it accumulates on the hair, it's like it, it somehow covers up all the little scales on the hair and it doesn't pull anything anymore, but a, a dull uh, middle of the range sound. It doesn't have the overtones. That's my experience. So if you're doing it, make sure you're doing it with high quality rosin. The other one, I don't even know what is, let me see. Yeah, uh, I somehow found this. It's, this is a mini rosin. Um, it's made by a company out West. They make very small, small batch rosin, like a winery kind of, kind of thing. And this one is infused with Chardonnay, which is their dark rosin. And then they have a light rosin, which is, I think, Mer not Merlot. Chardonnay is the light. Yeah, that's the light. Um, the other one is a Merlot, which is, uh, they call it infused with Merlot. Uh, it's a darker rosin. So I alternate between the two of them, but they're high organic, uh, uh, ingredients and they don't gum up the bow. And that's what I try to try to do when it gets to a point that it's not working. Karen wants to know, do bows like violins improve over time the more you play them? Yes, they do actually. Um, with new bows, it takes a while to get them going, I think, because it needs to find its place, the bow, the wood, it needs to find its vibration. It needs to start the, the, the timbers, the, the timber itself needs to loosen up so that you have the vibration in the hand. So as it grows, let's say the bow is 20 years old, the wood dries out a little bit, you get a little bit, actually the bow is lighter. The water content is less, it becomes uh, drier and you will get more overtones because it vibrates more. So what you see in the tort that was made in 1800, 1820 period, why does it sound so good? 
I think a lot of it has to do with that process because that piece of wood has been made and, and used for so long that you simply cannot find a modern piece of wood that will react that way. So people will say, well, yeah, but, 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 but you know, I think that it's natural to say that. And besides, wood at that time has less carbon, if you think about it. So all the composition is different with the aging going through summers, winters, every year going like that. It helps the wood to do this kind of process. And in the process of getting older, it actually, it becomes drier and is more brittle slightly. But that slight difference is what makes the sound so alive, I think. Well, and um, along those same lines, because Kimberly asked next, she was asking about it, if the bows had a break-in period, a new bow, how long would you, well, I'm, I'm assuming you wouldn't purchase a brand new bow if you didn't already love it, but how long would you think the break-in period on a bow is? Each one is different. My experience is that each piece of wood has, has its own time. Sometimes it's six months, sometimes it's a year, sometimes you get so tired of it, you put it in the case and then y'all touch it for five years and take it out and you go, whoa, what happened? Uh, that I have experienced too. So uh, it, each one has its time, each one has its thing. So you, ha you have to listen to it, I think. But uh, it, it's, it, that's important, I think. Instead of saying, well, in six months, if it doesn't sound good, well, you know, it doesn't work that way. I don't think. Gotcha. All right, so iPad 8, I don't know who this is, <laughs> but they're asking, what measures do you use to keep a bow in really good condition? What measures? Oh, well, um, as a rule, I always wipe off the rosin. I wipe off, wipe off all fingerprints the frog, I make sure that I wipe everything off because the sweat, everybody's sweat is different too. The sweat contains a lot of acid. And if you don't wipe it off and you let it sit on a piece of pearl, that's when it starts doing its job overnight until you meet the bow again tomorrow. So, some people have pearl slides that will last forever. Some people will have pearl slides that we eat through in three weeks. And I think it really has to do with the acidity of the sweat. So as a rule, I always have a little rag. When I finish playing, I take off all fingerprints possible and keep it clean. And I don't use anything else. I don't let it build up in other words. So that will keep the bow in good condition. And of course, you have you have to take the take the bow to the the bow maker to have it main, maintain and 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 uh, whatever work it needs to have. Do you? How often do you rehair your bows that you're using on a regular basis? Uh, well, I alternate about when I go to work. I I have about four of them. I alternate nine months. Uh, I'm, I'm one of those that I don't break hair. Uh, some people break a lot of hair when they play. I'm one of those that I'm lucky that I don't break a lot. Maybe one or two. So uh, it's easier on me, in other words. I know somebody in the orchestra that will rehear the bow no matter what, once a month. Uh, well, that's, that's this person's likes. So, I know who you're talking about. Uh, I don't know who you're talking about. But the thing is, well, I'm just saying that there are people like that. They believe that it will be the best thing for his playing. And I, for me, if I hear that, I said, what are you doing to the Pharaoh? You see? Once a month is a lot of operation on the pharaoh. You put the plug in once a month, you know, no matter how good you do it, you are still going through that process. So it's what people like. It's their little uh, habits, 
is what they believe in. And um, some people will not be here both for six years and it still grips. So it's hard to say, I think. But I think in general, uh, anywhere six to eight months for a rehair, it's pretty normal, I think. Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? And, and have I missed any? Because my chat went, it traveled pretty quickly there for a while and I was afraid I was missing some. Um, if I do, so my last question for you, Raymond, maybe, yes. maybe. <laughs> this is my favorite topic of conversation, so I could probably do this all night. But if somebody wanted to learn more about bows in general, where yes. would you send them? What would you tell them to do? Well, I think if you talk to a bow maker, talk to uh, like coming into health makers and asking questions, simple questions like what was being asked. You begin to fill up a lot of these little bits and pieces together. You try to put them together and there's no right and there's no wrong. And I think that a lot of people do think that what well, there is a way to do it and there's it's always the, the opposite. Either you do this or you do, don't do that. Well, how about the middle? Uh, that's important. So the more you talk to people, the more you gain the knowledge of knowing what you like in a bow. For me, I always like the hair short. And people will go, ah, 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 you can't do that. It's, putting that. it's okay, it's okay. You know, I like it. I like it a little bit because by the time you wind it up, the frog is not too far away so that the bow is balanced. That's me. And some people will say, oh, no, no, I, I wouldn't do that. So until you try it, you wouldn't know. So one time you can walk into the hub maker's violence and say, well, how about this? Can you rehear it slightly shorter? and allow enough time, like if you were here to vote tomorrow, you have to say, well, cold weather is coming in three weeks. What's it gonna do in three weeks? So you can't really have it that short. So you're saying half a millimeter, half a millimeter to, to shorter than what is normal and see what happens. And then you try it, I say, well, I don't really like this. Maybe I'll try this. So the more you experiment with that, the more you, you figure out what, what uh, fits for you. Do you have a favorite bow book? I took that out too. <laughs> While he's getting this, I do want to explain to everybody that bow books, they're not the kind of books you can go down to Barnes and Noble and buy. Ah, the well, this book. Mm -hmm. This book, I don't know if you know, I don't know if Dixie, Dixie knows about this or, or Buddy knows about this. All these notes, in this particular bow book by Redford were his diaries when he rehears a bow on the bench at Hill. They were all little, little notes that he put away and in sheets of paper in, in, a, in a drawer. And it was my friend Malcolm who said to him, you got to print it as a book. You got to have to do this. And this is the book. And that's the first bow book that we know of. And I, um, I think I could, I was lucky to have this signed copy. So I'm very proud of it because I never get to meet him, but I have visited his grave. You know, he was the one that established the Hill Workshop. So. Sorry, I'm answering the question because, um, um, she was asking who was the author and the author is Retford is the author's name. Yes, Bows and Bowmakers by William Retford. That's one book. The Rhoda book is fantastic. And then you have the, the French bow books in three volumes. The large But that is, that is like light years. Uh, this book is like so primitive in comparison. Uh, but those bow books, the French bow books, you can, you can see it from every angle possible. The pictures are incredible. The information about the, the, the bow makers it, it, it themselves are good. And it, it's interesting to read through it. 
but you have to take it small doses at a time because it's it's a lot of reading, a lot to absorb, mm -hmm. a lot to observe. Like if you look at a bow maker, well, this is different, but how different? You're talking about two makers. Well, what about if you put three, four bow makers in and how can you tell what the difference is? That takes time to digest, I think. But those are very good books to go to, yes. Aaron wants to know if there are any decent student bow manufacturers or workshops. Student bow making, you mean? I'm not like for students. Um, so workshops, Dorfler, Ari France, like all the different ones out there. Do you have yeah. any you would consider reputable or decent? Those, what you, those bows you mentioned are good. Some of the, the German bows are very good, but those are expensive now. They're, they're getting to be expensive. But the, this, the intermediate bows, some of them, if you go through them, you will find some very good playing bows, very good playing bows. So at that point, you really need to figure out what that bow does as a tool, because you need to learn how to take care of it. You need to know that this is not what you do with the bow, you know, by, by, you know and before you get into something, something um, French and something more um, of a higher level, because I think it all comes with it. Because you don't you don't put a a a, a, a satori in a seven seven year old hand to do it because it will be broken in, in an hour. Yeah, so that kind of thing. Natalie asked if um, how you deal with humidity when you play in different areas inside versus outside. Does, is it an issue with your bow? Yes, always an issue when you play outside here in Atlanta because it's so high. Uh, I come from a, I'm originally from Hong Kong. So if you have a bow that it's, that you think the hair length is good and you take it over there, it sags like this because the humidity level is so high. So when you travel, you gotta shorten it, shorten it to a point that it, it's, it's tight. You have to put the frog in very carefully, not to, not to uh, chip the frog and all of that. And by the time you land, it's just right. Yes, it's crazy. What we do is crazy. <laughs> um, Lucas wants to know who is your who are your top three contemporary favorite bow makers? Top three, I like. Um, What's this guy's name? Uh, you know, Chris, the one that I, I the, the gold mountain one I have. Charles Espy. Charles Espy, thank you. He's a great one. Uh, Thomas Show. Uh, huh? Thomas Show. Thomas Show is fantastic. Uh, I have seen, well, Michael, Michael Taylor, my friend who, who makes bows, I like his bows a lot because they're very user friendly. So there are lots of them out there. And I, to be, to be honest, I wish I know more at this point because they are incredible. What's out there, it's always good uh, with the new makers. But those I mentioned, I happen to have the chance to play on them, to know that, yes, I do love them. Um, so, Somebody asked who is on whose bow is on the cover of that Redford book? What bow is on the cover? I think it's a tort. I think I thought it was a tort too. Yeah, it's a it's a tort bow. Mm -hmm. oh, God, that's so pretty. Can you all see how beautiful that is? I want to see that bow. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's pretty. Um, Interesting. Um, and Lucas asked, Lucas, I don't know if I understand your question, sweetie. Um, you may have to unmute and ask it, but um, he said, does bows, I guess, lose their quality over the long run? Do, do bows lose their quality through age? Is that what you're asking, Lucas? Yes. Let's assume yes, unless he jumps in, so. Okay, well, uh, if it loses anything, chances are that you're losing the two curves. That curve, and when you look down the stick, 
the curve goes left and right. Sometimes the bow will pull to the left and right, but you know, the curve of the bow is put in artificially anyway. So, you know, there's a funny story about Voran. You know, he worked six day weeks. He would, he would do camber bows, make bows six days a week on Sundays. He will walk in and check the camber. So that thing moves all the time. So if you leave the bow uh, untouched for a, a, a long time, putting it in the, in, in the bow case, it will move by itself. It's, it's a constant thing. Like the bow you like, Perswa. Mm. I look down the stick, there's an S that goes on, right? And I tried everything in the book. I wanted to correct it every single time. Three days, I would, I would tell him, please, the bow is here, do it. Three days, he, he, he does it and it plays great. Next day you look at it, it started moving. And it's the piece of wood. The wood has its natural thing that it wants to do. So it de decides to pull this way, that way, and there's nothing you can do about it. And you hope that if you do it more uh, often enough, they might stay. Bill Salco is a was a famous bow maker and bow restorer. Yeah. And I heard him say in a class I took with him once that, um, that the, this, it's always wanting to go back to the tree that it was originally. And so, and that's how come you had to deal with that. So. Yeah. Yeah, and one of our, one of our um, people said that they have a Peugeot that looks yeah. like the one on that cover. Yes. Mm -hmm. Peugeots are very nice too. So. Well, look, I'm gonna actually start to bring this to a close. Um, I had a couple of other things that I wanted to say. Um, and I wanted to say to all of you that are participating that when you go to find a bow, like when you listen to um, Chris and Raymond talk, you see that nothing's carved in stone. So I would like to encourage all of you as you learn about bows and look at bows, don't paint yourself into a corner of it has to be this, this, or this, or this. Like Raymond is saying, it's personal, all the bows are different. So be really open. And anytime you meet a musician that plays your instrument, ask them if you can see their bow or ask them if they'll tell you about their bow. You'll I lot from other musicians don't ask if you can play it unless they offer it bows are very personal <laughs> you know I, I one more thing to add it's also funny too because if you go out and look for a bow you never find one and all of a sudden a bow just drops on your lap and that will be the bow so it's one of those things that you have to you have to just be patient i think when you find a bow and that's i think important yes or when the bow finds you Yes. <laughs> when the bow finds you. Um, so just a reminder to everybody, first of all, quick, Raymond, are you teaching private lessons through Zoom right now? Yes, I am. Okay, so Raymond is an extraordinary violin teacher as well as being a bow, really knowledgeable about bows. If you um, want coaching or private lessons, you can give him a holler, you can reach him through us easily. Um, you can also reach him through the Symphony website he's on there so um so i highly recommend that anyone do that and um next week our special guest is amy wilson she's the conductor of the atlanta philharmonic and she's a conductor which is cool how often have you gotten a chance to sit and interview and ask questions from a conductor she's a female conductor was a, which is unusual and um I, the next week's class is called Women in Charge. And so um, I hope that everyone will come and join us for that. If you have more questions for Raymond and you can't find him, shoot them to me at Huffmaker Violins and I'll send them straight to him. Uh, Anna, I do not mind if you send my email out. I would be happy to help. Uh, whoever wants to ask questions, please feel free to, to send me an email if you like. Awesome. Awesome. And, you know, I don't, there's no, really no way for us to all kind of applaud, but Raymond, everyone I know is applauding and because you are amazing. This. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> I have to yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Love you. Oh, love you too. Raymond, Anna. Dixie and, and Buddy, thank you so much. This was great. I appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. Good to see you, Chris. All right. I'll see y'all, you guys, next week. I'm hanging up because I'm going to go watch some TV. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good night. Okay.
Bye-bye. Bye, Bravo. She gives me how to do this.